Hello and welcome to IEEE Soft Robotics Podcast. Uh, hello, Professor Robert. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I would like to ask you first how you would like to introduce and define yourself uh, for the audience for the first time listening to you. Sure, and thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to discuss these topics with you. So I'm, I'm Rob Wood. I'm a faculty member in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University. I have a lab which focuses more on the sort of material side of robotics, and that's been uh, along the lines of robotics at small scales and more recently uh, robots that are composed of compliant materials. Wonderful, yeah. So in each episode, we ask about the childhood, the signature question. I'm curious, how was your childhood be interested in science or technology? How it was? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think it was fairly the, uh, the sort of, you know, typical yeah. engineering upbringing in the sense that my grandfather was an engineer, my father's an engineer, my brother's an engineer, I'm an engineer. And so, uh, you know, playing with Legos, making remote control planes yeah. and boats and such that would respectively crash and sink. But nonetheless, uh, uh, yeah, but fairly typical in terms of, of tinkering, mm -hmm. making, building, fixing. Yeah, wonderful, yeah. So since you are curious about bio-inspired uh, designs and also nature, I guess what do you think is still something you found hard to understand or design from nature to understand what's happening in, for example, you have been inspired by, uh, for example, bees for a designer with bees. So what's something still hard to understand? Oh, design? yeah, a tremendous amount of, of, you know, there's a great deal of enviable uh, features in biology, of course, that we're not even close to being able to, uh, to be able to recreate. Uh, I think that, you know, work, that one of the, the pleasures of my career thus far has been working with outstanding biologists who are studying structure function and natural systems and behavioral, uh, you know, neuroethology aspects and natural systems. And that, you know, those, those form a lot of the blueprints for what we've done in the past. And, and there are, you know, countless examples of uh, behaviors, for example, which you know, I think are, are, are very poorly understood. But for some aspects, you know, you, you can get a sense. So, you know, the specific example I'll give is is understanding the fluid mechanics of flapping wing flight. Uh, historically, very challenging topic, uh, but through the diligence of, of a number of, of biologists in the field have studied, you know, natural insect flight, for example, and, and pinpointed the principles which are most, uh, most relevant in terms of what the wing, how the wing is moving, how the wing is deforming, how the wing is shaped, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So those are types of things which are, are rather concrete for us. But I think that those are the, those are the exception, not the norm. I feel like there's, there's so much complexity in these natural systems, for example, in the behavior of autonomy. I mean, mm -hmm. that's something that, that ro you know, roboticists have been striving to do for, you know, well, I guess not quite a hundred years, but you know, but, you know, several decades to understand how we can design systems to be autonomous, and you know, there's there is a, a massive disconnect between the level of autonomy that we see in natural systems and, and the level that we can that we can achieve in robotics. Mm -hmm. I think this is a really great point. Maybe I'm curious about uh, what's mis missing here. What could be the missing piece? For example, you highlighted a lot about modeling, and I'm curious about this modeling in that case because there's a lot of question we received from students that which level we have to go for in modeling and should we replicate what we see in the nature? For example, you say this level autonomy and we can't achieve. So what could be still missing and which level you have to go for to understand or design? Yeah, it's hard to pinpoint, you know, one thing, but I, I would say there, there's several things that stand out, you know, and I think that it, I think it's important to draw a distinction before diving into this that's, you know, between biomimicry and bioinspiration. So I think it's important that if, if uh, you know, roboticists or engineers in general uh, look to nature for inspiration for various designs, whether that's of physical structure or of control system or whatever, uh, that they do so with the principles in mind and, and not just structure alone. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that said, you know, what are the things where, where we lag behind? Um, and, and, and I think it's, it's sort of, you know, across the spectrum of the sort of, you know, subfields of robotics. So mm -hmm. everything from actuation, uh, you know, we have no, we're getting close, but we have no substitute or I should say, you know, functional equivalent of muscle. I mean, muscle is ubiquitous in 
natural system and 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 uh, you know animals, of course, but there is no uh, you know uh, engineering synthetic equivalent that that sort of is able to match all of its properties across the broad spectrum of properties you might be interested in. Same thing with energy storage and, and metabolism. You know, our the the system the system integration, if you will, and, and biological systems is so so tight through the process of evolution, uh, mm -hmm. and and we we can't achieve you know the, the levels of efficiency. At least you know if we're not talking about wheeled vehicles, if we're talking about things that are more uh, you know sort of bio inspired, we can't attain that level of sort of energetic efficiency yet. Uh, you know, going to the autonomy piece. Perception in robotics has advanced, you know, greatly. You know, decades worth of SLAM and and all the way down to you know sensor work and vision uh, has advanced tremendously. Um, yet we, you know, we we still don't have a can't nearly reach the level of of autonomy. And when I when I say what do I mean by autonomy? You know, accomplishing a task in an unstructured environment. You know, we can't nearly you know come close to the level of autonomy that that natural systems would achieve. Um, you know, if this, 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 as soon as you go outside a, a very structured uh, sort of environment. So there's many, you know, distilling that, those sort of sentiments down into uh, you know, research tasks is, is sort of the fun part, right? And, and so we, you know, we don't cover, you know, all of that, you know, at all, of course, but, you know, we, we sort of zoom in on some of the hardware aspects. And I think that's where soft robotics comes into play very nicely. Mm -hmm. That's also a great point. So maybe a related question about that. What could be area here, or maybe direction we have to focus on of research? You think it's very promising, but maybe soft robotics community still disagree, or we don't have much attention to tackle these issues you mentioned. I mean, I'm a I'm a hardware guy, so I I tend to be more focused on the sort of physical components of these of, of the robots that we create. I think that you know over the past decade or, or several decades in soft robotics has been, you know, tremendously fruitful in terms of figuring out all the different things that we could build and, and some, uh, you know, really excellent work on how we could power these systems, actuate these systems. Um, but, but again, going back to my comment on muscle, for example, they're, they're really, you know, actuation within soft robotics is, is still to me a huge challenge. So, you know, a lot of soft robots are powered by fluidic systems. And, and, if, and if it's, you know, if the task is okay with having a, you know, fluidic power source and or a tether, um, then, then great. Those, those fluidically actuated, uh, you know, soft artificial muscles, whatever you want to call them, uh, have, have seen a tremendous amount of success. And, and we, we do this as well very frequently with some of the soft manipulators that we're developing and soft grippers. Um, but if you if you can't have this tether for whatever reason, there's minimal uh, you know there's there's minimal solutions that have presented themselves. You know, dielectric elastomer actuators, for example, perhaps some of the most promising. Some liquid crystal elastomer based actuators, uh, you know, thermal phase change, etc. There there are a number of promising candidates, but we haven't reached the 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 sort of you know gold standard, if you will that we have in other areas of robotics, more classical areas of robotics that we would have as like a, you know, electromagnetic motor, right? Yeah. Bottom line, if you can't use an electromagnetic motor, for example, in a soft robot, what are you gonna use? And so I think that that's one of the areas that I think is, is, is essential and perhaps, you know, lagging a bit behind our, you know, more traditional rigid uh, robotics counterparts. And I could mm -hmm. say if you, you know, I could say, uh, power as well, power systems, but that's of course integrally tied to the actuation system. Um, you know, again, if, if, if it's a fluidically driven system, then the power question actually becomes pretty, pretty daunting. You know, how am I gonna go from electrochemical from a battery to mechanical to a pump to mechanical in a, in a pressurized fluid, for example, you know, those, it's, none of those are, are sort of, you know, mm -hmm super yeah. difficult challenges but but thinking about the whole system um is, is something we should we should you know perhaps pay a little, a little bit more attention to yeah i think also maybe a quick question here about the trade-offs for example and and so for robotics community we have this trade-off between some time is for any conductive polymer that the mechanical performance and response time i don't know what could be the uh, like unavoidable trade-off for when you design robotry for example it's, just ch it's challenging to work in this scale what could be unavoidable trade-offs? Unavoidable trade-offs. I mean, I think that the classic one in soft robotics specifically is the trade-off between uh, 
you know, delicate, uh, you know, low force, low contact force interactions, whether it's for locomotion or grasping manipulation and precision. And, and so, you know, that brings about a question of control, of modeling, of sensing. And, and I, I, you know, I see that that's to me where the, where the trade-off exists. If, if you, you know, there, there is the trade-off, I guess I was alluding to just a minute ago about actuation. You know, if I had a super high performance muscle-like actuator, some of these challenges might be alleviated. Um, but the sort of overarching set of trade-offs in soft robotics in my mind are, are these trade-offs between uh, precision and, um, and, and compliance and delicate interactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's about that, yeah. So maybe I'm curious about the challenges. We something is still maybe unsolvable dilemma for you in designing and modeling. It's still, yeah, want to tackle this challenge. What that should, should, could be uh, from your experience? Specific to designing and, and modeling? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's, um, there's been a, a lot of fantastic work on, you know, the, the, the things that, and going back to the precision thing, the, the thing that we lose, of course, is if we, if we have, if we assume rigid kinematic chains, mm -hmm. that forward inverse kinematics, dynamics, et cetera, is, is solved and has been solved for decades. So that's, that's great. Uh, the second we go away from that, then the, the computational complexity, we could do the same thing and we do do the same thing, you know, just breaking it down and thinking about a can, you know, a continuously compliant system uh, as a set of rigid links and compliant joints, but now there's a huge amount of them and we can do that. But of course the computational complexity, computational cost of doing that goes way up. So there's another trade-off I think is in the sort of precision of modeling versus the precision or versus the, the sort of speed of modeling and, and the sort of throughput you could get. And that, you know, on one hand, you know, we, we could develop, we, we, a lot of people are using finite element techniques for, uh, you know, like exploring uh, soft devices in, in their designs. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you know, the iteration time perhaps can start to approach the time it would take to experimentally build one of these things and actuate it, you know, investigate it, characterize it, whatever. So, so I think there, there's a, a, a uh, there's some difficulty here in trying to decide where to live in that space ranging from you know precision of a model to speed of a model and there's a number of frameworks which i think are emerging and you know we're developing one uh you know the other aspect of this which is maybe subtle but but important is how easy these things are to use can we can we develop something that could be a ross plugin can we develop something that would be you know python based that would be you know easy for people to pick up can we develop a soft robot URDF equivalent uh, that would allow us to, you know, do the types of, of, of sort of design studies in simulation that we might not, that we're currently really um, tied to experiments for? So, so I think that the, the modeling question is 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 very important, and I think it also has a strong connection to what I was saying before of this trade-off between. Uh, precision in, you know, motion precision, for example, or, or, mm -hmm. or force or contact force, uh, you know, precise control over contact force, etc. And, and versus just sort of, you know, being less precise with our models, less precise with our controllers and allowing the compliance of the system to take over. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. So maybe for the material selection, do you think we have a, a deep understanding of the smart material? And when you select this kind of material, is it you think about what oh, could be better for functionality or man manufacturing. How you assess that, and what kind of material you aspire to have as well? Yep. You think it would be uh, advantageous for your designing? So I think this is where uh, one of the things that's most exciting about soft robotics to me is that we've opened up the door to connections with material scientists, and in, mm -hmm. in a way that that I, you know I'll say you know for my own institution at, at Harvard very strong uh, historically in, in material science and very strong in particular in soft condensed matter physics. But none of them I don't think would call, you know, the, my colleagues there would, I don't think they would have, you know, 10 years ago thought of themselves as roboticists. But now, there, you know, there's, there's half a dozen or more people who are developing uh, materials that, they're, that they can easily connect with challenges in soft robotics, whether it's, you know, meta materials that deform in interesting ways uh, 
uh, whether it's you know materials that could be useful for actuation, um, dielectric elastomer, you know, different elastomer formulations that would be uh, conducive either for the performance or the fabrication of dielectric elastomers. Novel techniques for additive manufacturing of you know complex topologies of of three D of of, of, of uh, soft robots. So so I think that that's one of the the sort of really positive benefits of this thrust in soft robotics is bringing other aspects of science into the robotics realm. And in terms of what I would want in terms of materials, um, I, I think I'm, I'm biased a little bit towards some of our current efforts in studying dielectric elastomer actuators. Uh, and, and so there, there's a number of, it's probably too, you know, too many to get too deep into in, in this discussion, but you know, we, we do have a, a sort of wish list of material properties that we would want from elastomer electrodes. I think we're at the stage now for a lot of things, dielectric elastomers being one, but perhaps other soft robot components, be, you know, that I could name as well. I could tell you what material properties we want. And I mm. could tell you that, you know, with, with pretty, you know, pretty specific ranges on material properties, on dielectric property, whatever. Uh, and so, so I think that we're in a very good spot now. Now, can, again, connecting the dots with our material scientist colleagues to try to sort of understand that polymer chemists uh, to try to understand are there are there existing solutions or can we come up with uh, custom solutions for this? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we're at the stage where we can do that now. Yeah, and maybe here is also maybe yeah our, our argument about the trade-off between or maybe between ionic one ionic conductive polymer and the electric the the high voltages. Do you think one day can combine both of them just to have this feature of low power and also high mechanical performance, for example, do you think that something could be viable to be done with uh, with dielectric elastomers specifically? Yes, or, ionic uh, the ionic one with dielectric elastomer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is another set of trade offs, and this this also goes back to my comments on on uh, the sort of perfect actuator, the soft actuator, artificial muscle, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it doesn't yet exist, really, right? And because I can find challenges with any one of these right so there's maybe it's you know the ipmc type actuators uh the ionically driven actuators great they have you know low voltages they're compliant uh but the time constants are slow you know dielectric elastomers you know have a lot of nice properties reasonably high energy densities you know bandwidth succeeding artificial muscle but right they're, they're field driven so they require relatively high voltages um so so i think you know I can't speak too much to the IPMC ionically driven actuator world, but for dielectric elastomers, a lot of it, in my opinion, is going to be driven by fabrication techniques. Can we bring techniques from soft lithography, from uh, even MEMS or IC uh, derived techniques, to bear on creating, for example, you know, multi-layer stacks of DEAs where the individual layers have, uh, you know, are several microns thick and are uh, you know, are, are, have uniformities on the order of, you know, tens to hundreds of nanometers. Uh, can we do similar things with, uh, you know, electrodes maybe that are based, you know, what we do is based upon either silver nano, uh, silver nanowires or uh, single wall carbon nanotubes or, you know, whatever. There's, mm -hmm. I think that some of these sort of practical challenges, which are, you know, a, a, a barrier for some of these actuators, dielectric elastomers, for example, Mm -hmm. I think we can start to lower those, you know, incrementally to get down to, you know, hundred hundreds of volts, maybe even less than a hundred volts. Yeah. And which, you know, if we start to cross that barrier, then mm -hmm. then you know, the yeah. practical practical side kind of goes away. Great, yeah. So I'm curious about. Uh, I think you said a lot of time that we learn from failure, and that's maybe give you a lot of insight as what could be uh, lead to more success in designing process. And I guess where, where's the direction you thought out would work very, very well, uh, but when you're testing, it was surprising to you, there was surprising result. It's just you didn't expect it. Maybe in the modeling or simulation, you expect a certain performance, but in empirical result, which is something counterintuitive to you or surprising. I mean, uh, I don't know if I could pinpoint a single time, but it, that's a, that's a, uh, ubiquitous theme in our lab, and, and I know many other labs too, is that, you know, if, if you develop a model for something and you build that thing and it works exactly like the, the model said it would, that's great, but you don't really learn from that, right? It just tells you that you already knew everything about it to begin with. 
And so, you know, a lot of times, you know, younger students will come in into the lab and and will, you know, get frustrated that they are building a, a mechanism, an actuator, whatever, and they think they understand the, the underlying physics, and then they go and build it, and it's, you know, the model is 20, 30, 50 percent off of what their what their experimental results say. Great. You know, that means that you have to track that, you have to understand why is it, why is it diverging? What is it about? The way that you built it, or where are the assumptions failing, or whatever it is, um, and and so I think that this there's a there's that mindset of you know recognizing that you know any interesting problem there's going to be all sorts of unknowns and finding the the sort of the, the the reason behind those unknowns is is the fun part and b you know for us in particular this is demanded that we have the ability to very rapidly iterate experimentally uh, because you know some of the things that we might study we we don't we don't know we don't have the the full picture of 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 how these things should work before we actually build them and we we have decent intuition we have decent models we have you know an understanding of the literature whatever but but you gotta you gotta have the ability to really uh cycle through you know, iteration after iteration, and 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 that's part of the fun. I mean, building. We're all engineers, right? So building mm-hmm. is fun. Um, but I can, of course, appreciate that this is also frustrating. You know, if you spend hours or days or weeks building a device and it, and it fails, that's a hard thing to teach a young engineer. Is that that's okay? You know, turn that into a success by really understanding what's going on. Why did it fail? How can we make this better? How can we make it work? You know, the second or third or fourth time you build it. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot of psychology involved in in, in that to, to sort of push us towards being comfortable yeah. with failure uh, as and not just comfortable with it, but embracing it and, and having it be a natural part of our process. Mm-hmm. I really like this point. And maybe a quick question here about um, what you say because I think maybe I don't know if you agree or not. But there's a tendency sometimes, especially in an academic environment, the pressure to get a result. And sometimes failure on result is not accepted at all. And you have to publish. And uh, because if you make mistakes or failure, that means you're wasting time and, uh, and resources. Of course, I agree with what he said. But do you think that's something well, well instilled in academic environment or we still we have to shift this mentality that you have to, to, to embrace what you mentioned? Yeah, so that's hard. Yeah, yeah that, that's a hard one because you know it's easy for me to say because I don't know I've done this for ten whatever it is fifteen years now, uh, and so I can it's easy for me to say like oh just build it and if it doesn't work we'll learn it learn about it and build it again and who cares if it takes another year or whatever right uh, but for you know for a younger student that that is trying to make a name for themselves I, I totally I, I get that and and. Uh, in particular, you know, as time goes on, it only seems to be increasing the sort of pressure to, you know, ramp up, you know, productivity, whatever that means, and and sort of accelerate your research outputs um, because everybody else is. So if you don't, then you're not going to keep up. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that it does. It, it it forces us to think deeply about. The, the the goal of whatever the research topic we have what is the device that we're trying to make supposed to do how can we uh you know can we identify things that are probably going to be hard can we identify things that we could have sort of early you know early good results with and so so i think there's some design of the research process as well that could help alleviate some of these concerns but i think that you know i would push back a little bit on this uh in, in the sense that you know if if the the goal is not publications i mean it, it is because if you have a publication then presumably you have something interesting to write about the goal is is the is the basic science and under an understanding of the basic science so if our goal was just publications we could you know choose a a, a topic a, a device we wanted to build that would be easy to build and we could write a paper about it and be happy with that and, and that's that's fine but that might tend us towards choosing problems which are sort of fast and not easy necessarily, but but quick, right? And and maybe pu- might push us away from the hard problems. And I think that would be a that would be um, very unfortunate. 
Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank you for this uh, great answer. And I totally agree with you. And we have one question before going to audience question is, but how we can access this beneficial geometric and material nonlinearities to have interesting information. Since you're designing, mentioning designing is very challenging and sometimes it tends to fabrication also more challenging. So I don't know how you can understand from the nature what could be the beneficial geometric and material nonlinearities, or maybe you can tweak it in a different way, it just doesn't exist in nature. So I don't know how we see this coupling, this geometric nonlinearities and the material nonlinearities to have this interesting deformation. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have a clean answer for that, but I think that the just embracing, it kind of goes back to my previous comment about, you know, choosing hard problems. I mean, mm -hmm. if I can, if I can find a, if, if I can find a linear time invariant model for a system that I'm building or analyzing or whatever, great. But, you know, the world is not linear, right? And so, so having, uh, you know, embracing the fact that I, I have to recognize that my models, my devices are going to, are going to likely exhibit some level of nonlinearity. That's one thing. But I mean, I think that the, the real question is like, okay, well, where does nonlinear, nonlinear behavior crop up in, in natural or synthetic systems and, and how can we understand it and embrace it? So, so I think that there is, um, there's a number of, of, you know, ideas that I, that I have in that realm. So one, for example, is, um, there is a team that I'm involved with, which is exploring uh, ultra fast motions in biological and synthetic systems. Uh, uh, this is a, a project that's uh, led by a collaborator, Sheila Paddock at Duke. And, and she's been studying, uh, for lack of a better word, I guess, nonlinearity or, or power amplification or, or whatever in biological systems for years. So, so I think that there, there are many systems in nature which unsurprisingly exhibits a great de de deal of nonlinearity. And that's not just in terms of the mechanisms that they, they have, you know, how, how I can sort of rapidly trigger a jump or, uh, you know, or, or, or a punch or whatever by um, rapid, slowly storing and rapidly releasing energy through some nonlinear latching mechanism, et cetera. That, that's one aspect of it, but but understanding nonlinearity in terms of of control, in terms of um, you know not just developing a, a sort of controller that could do something interesting with a nonlinear system, but actually leveraging that nonlinearity, for example, to push us further towards autonomy, to be able to you know change uh, change control modes from a you know nice controlled motion to some chaotic oscillation that's going to sort of get us out of the jam. So, so I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure if I have a sort of clean answer of how to leverage this other than to embrace it and to not necessarily fall into the trap of let's try to linearize around, around some equilibrium point or configuration or whatever. That's fine. Uh, but, but again, the world is nonlinear. Let's try to understand how we can, and you know, there's, there's lots of examples in it going to the material side. So I was mentioning before that uh, one of the great things about the, the recent push in soft robotics is that it, that it you know, brings uh, so, you know, uh, material scientists closer to the field of robotics. You know, there's a, a whole group of studies in, in metamaterials. How can we understand how uh, the, the sort of, let's say micro or, or mesostructure of various materials could dramatically modify their bulk properties, uh, the sort of macroscopic properties, and you know through buckling or through uh, you know other sort of energy storage and release mechanisms. Uh, so let's let's explore that. Let's let's mm -hmm. figure out where you know I think that there's a lot of sort of connecting the dots we can do between a behavior we might see and what are the underlying materials properties or just sort of lumped parameter properties that we might want, and then connecting the dots with our material science friends to see. Uh, are there solutions uh, in structured materials, in uh, you know kinematic linkage mechanisms, in uh, things that make or break contact? Um, you know how you know this, this has come up a little bit, you know, outside of soft robotics as well. Not a little bit, come up with a lot in, in um, the manipulation communities and the uh, locomotion communities. Things which make or break contacts. Things which uh, you know, go from unloaded to loaded, and uh, you know, so there's there's countless instances in robotics in which there are um, discontinuities or nonlinearities, uh, and, and let's let's embrace that. Let's not try to um, 
you know, do feedback linearization on everything. Mm -hmm. Thanks for this answer. Yeah. So we will go for the audience question. The first one is from Javier. He said that I know that in the literature, one of the newer approaches for soft sensing is to embed, embed tons of uh, cheap se strain sensors that aren't very sensitive individually, but whose reading uh, as a whole uh, are right enough uh, that a trained agent can classify an interaction very well. So he asks, he is very curious if you believe this is uh, where the entire field of soft robotics is moving towards us. For example, should we expect more of these amorphous structures that learn uh, their own dynamics in contrast to the predefined kinematics of uh, hard robotics? Yeah, and this is another area where I think that we could draw connections to other fields and that would be very fruitful. So now not on, not on the material side necessarily, but to the, the learning and deep learning communities. Um, you know, again, whereas if I just have a, let's say a five link, you know, serial chain manipulator, and I want to do, you know, path planning or grass planning or something like that, I, you know, applying supervised or unsupervised learning techniques towards that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But now if I have, as you're, you're describing, if I have a compliant robot that has, you know, effectively an infinite you know, number of degrees of freedom, and I've, I can somehow embed tens or hundreds of sensors, simple, like you say, in there, um, I will presumably do that to the best of my ability as an engineer, maybe using models, maybe using finite element, maybe asking questions about where I want to place these sensors to maximize signal to noise, where I want to, uh, where I expect the maximum deformations to be, etc. But at the end of the day, how I'm going to make sense out of that is, is likely to be intractable to all those sensor readings. And so I think that this is a fantastic place where machine learning techniques could be brought to bear. And, and, and frankly, I don't see any other way around that. Uh, you know, we've, we, we had a study recently where we were developing um, a wearable sleeve that uh, had now only a few sensors in it, uh, you know, four, I think. Uh, but they were just measuring sort of very, you know, small uh, strains in the, the, the wearable sleeve that were due to motion of the underlying musculature. And, you know, what do we want to do with this? Well, we could use this for, you know, human computer interfaces or, you know, gesture recognition. We, we, we did a study where we could uh, actually infer gestures that, that the hand was making. So, you know, reasonably simple gestures, et cetera, but, but just based upon simple measurements of the, the underlying strain from, from muscle movements in the forearm. So how I could come up with a first principled model of going from muscle activity in the forearm to strain to local strains that would tell me a mapping to what my fingers are doing, it would be very difficult in my estimation, but just applying a very simple off the shelf machine learning technique uh, mm -hmm. was, was very simple. Yeah. So I think there's an opportunity there. And that, that's just one example, but I think there's an opportunity there, not just an opportunity, a need there to connect mm -hmm. you to those communities. Yeah. And there's also a question from Pratik. He said, hello, Professor Wood. I am a mechanical engineer, uh, engineering undergraduate with two years of work experiences in aerospace firm. I'm currently developing uh, computer vision programs uh, for drone software. He is interested in pursuing higher studies and autonomous system, particularly ensuring safety and autonomous system. And he would like to know what are uh, prerequisite or background to study uh, and he needs to complete in order to apply universities for this domain. Is there any course or study material that you would recommend? For, um, well, I mean, it's, it's broad. It's a broad question, right? Because yeah. if, if I claim that I'm a roboticist, then that's great, but I, I, I probably want to claim, you know, some, some deeper domain knowledge in some subfield of robotics. So, you know, are you a, you know, more of the control set modeling controls perception autonomy side? Are you more of, uh, you know, hardware mechanics, materials, design, manufacturing side? Um, then I think that the answer would be a slightly different. I think that there is, you know, the core courses in, in robotics, you know, the classical courses of which there are a number of textbooks, uh, you know, just to get us all sort of speaking the same language and understanding the history around how we can model serial and parallel chain manipulators, uh, et cetera. But then I think beyond that, you go, you go deeper into sort of these subfields and start talking about, you know, maybe I'm a roboticist, but I take, 
uh, you know, a linear systems course. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a roboticist, but I take a, you know, nonlinear control, you know, linear control, nonlinear control uh, courses, sequence of courses, uh, applied controls. I think that one is maybe gets lost in the mix as well. At least when I was, you know, when I was younger, is you know, it's great to think about the theory and to think of, 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 for example, for control systems, linear, nonlinear, whatever, but um, applying those to practical systems. So like embedded systems courses and courses where I think these are more common these days, at least they are uh, in, in where I am, but, um, you know, thinking about not just the theory behind it, but how do I implement this? And then on the flip side, you know, if I call myself a hardware sort of person, roboticist, then I, you know, I better understand mechanics of materials. And, you know, I better understand um, you know, the, the sort of fabric, you know, techniques around in, in both from a sort of historical perspective, but also from, um, you know, more modern perspective on how, uh, rapid prototyping, you know, various manufacturing techniques, um, understanding various aspects of transduction, how do sensors work, how do actuators work. Um, so, so I think that, you know, there's in my mind, Maybe I'm being too strict and just sort of sectioning this into, into two categories, but there's probably, you can make the argument there's three or four or five subcategories within robotics. Um, but I guess my adv general advice would be to start off being broad, make sure that you understand the sort of top level sort of broad robotics, classical sort of robotics course, but then make sure that you have some breadth, uh, some depth, excuse me, in, in, in one of these subfields. Great. I also have a question from uh, Russ. He asked, uh, uh, how would you calculate uh, power users in flexible robotics? Is it electric, pneumatic, hydraulic, or some combination? This is a hard uh, question because, you know, again, if I have a rigid serial chain system, uh, then I can easily, through some joint encoders, uh, whatever, I can easily sort of understand the all of the sort of configuration variables, the state of the system at any given time. I can understand the velocities. I can understand the the torques. I can understand motor torques. I can understand whatever. And there's only you know the the dimensionality of this configuration space is finite and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's it's obviously easier to quantify things like power and efficiency for those types of systems. I think for these compliant systems where now I have continuous deformations. Mm -hmm. This gets this gets trickier because, you know, what is useful work is one question, you know, like, do I, one thing I could do is to be conservative is say, well, what is the strain energy? If I, if I say, you know, what is the work being done by the system? What is the strain energy in, in, in as this compliant manipulator deforms and call that, you know, call that energy the, you know, the upper bound of, of the, the work being done by the system. Uh, maybe not maybe that's of course not all useful work so then that gets even harder like how you know how am i applying this to a load um you know if, if it's just the um if it's just sort of measuring the work done on a load maybe that's a little bit easier um but but it's tricky if i wanted to say you know what is the efficiency of this soft robotic manipulator it's tricky because the deformation are likely to be going to consist of many things that are useful and many things that aren't ultimately of course we just measure the power input. And so if I am electrically driving this, I, I measure instantaneous current voltage and, and I and I and I'm all set, right? And whether or not that gets applied to useful or or, or non-useful work by the manipulator, that's what would I guess would, would partially define the efficiency of the system. Uh, fluidics, same thing, but you know, maybe maybe a couple intermediate steps I have to then understand sort of bulk flow, fluid flow, and pressures throughout the system. Maybe it's not as easy as measuring current voltage, but same principles apply. That's a good point. Yeah. And the other question I ask is also how do you simulate flexible robotics reliably? Can a standard simulation uh, simulator work in that case? Yeah, we, we uh I'll I'll give a, a, a plug, although it's not it's not out yet, but uh, maybe a, a preview for a uh, a tool that we've been developing uh that is will hopefully be useful to the broader community. Uh, and I won't say too much about it because we'll we'll hopefully share that uh, soon. But um, I, I, and I think a number of groups are are doing this as well. Um, you know, we uh, have been focusing mostly on thinking about an intermediate state. I was I was describing this before, like you know, this trade off between precision in these simulations and speed mm -hmm. of the simulations, right? 
And as well as this maybe less quantifiable thing, but how easily accessible are the, these environments, right? Can I just jump, if I know Python, can I just jump right in, for example? Um, and so we've been, been developing our own tool that I think sits um, in between the sort of finite elements and the you know lumped parameter uh, sort of levels of analysis of a soft system. And, and basically it just unsurprisingly breaks up a uh, continuously compliance arm, finger, hand, whatever, into uh, you know compliant joints and and, and rigid links. Um, but each of these then each of these subcomponents then can be sort of calibrated uh, by simple experiments. It can be done um, such that you have you know however many of these sort of nodes that you want, and um, or how few if you wanted to sort of speed mm -hmm. it up. Uh, and you can sort of, so, so in this way, you can tailor the accuracy of these simulations um, mm -hmm. or the speed of the simulation. So, so this, these are tools that are um, sort of easy to understand, uh, difficult to build and have them be universal, if that's, that's probably not the right word to use, but to be, uh, to encompass as many soft robotic morphologies as, uh, as, we, as we possibly could. So these these are things that are under development. I know again, I know other mm -hmm. things similar. Hopefully, uh, hopefully these will be more broadly accessible uh, in, 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 the, in the coming months. That's wonderful. I think it sounds cool uh, tool. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. And the last question from the audience from Jordan he said that uh, what branches of control theory should engineer looking to work with soft robots or be studying as well. The same also for microbotic. What are the foundational work for soft robotics to catch up in the field, and also for microbotics uh, as well? Yeah, it's. I mean, for soft robotics, so soft robotics in particular, I think that there's a lot of these questions about modeling. Can I come up with a with an analytical model that mm -hmm. would capture the dynamics? I think that's maybe a little more important than thinking about exactly what control and what sort of control style I would have, but. In from our experience in microbotics and and undoubtedly from our experience in soft robotics, there's always unmodeled errors, right? There's always unmodeled components that um, we just didn't quite get the physics right, and, and so that's again we should embrace that. We should you know that's not that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, and so what we've tended towards in our in our control systems are adaptive controllers, which can which can you know reliably compensate for 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 some of those unknowns so so that you know adaptive would be my sort of default go-to um uh but yeah but i think again the, the modeling side uh, strikes me as, as uh, the first and, and most important aspect great yeah so at closing the hand and have a few questions left the first one what is your aspiration maybe your research and also life in general what are your aspirations uh I mean, so specifically the field of soft robotics, getting you know robots out of the factories and uh, you know warehouses and highly structured environments, very successful. Don't want to take anything away from from that field of robotics. That's mm -hmm. and that that's catalyzed countless innovations and uh, you know really brought the field to to where it is today. Um, but uh, what I'd like to do is get robots out of those environments and specifically into homes and hospitals. And uh, so I think, you know, software, there's, there's many ways you can envision doing this, making mm -hmm. perception autonomy questions easier, safety aspects uh, better. Another way to do that is to think about these non-built environments or even human-centric environments as delicate, right? And so... Uh, you know, so one way around the the sort of some of these safety issues would just be compliance. I know that that's this is sort of the point, right? This is the point of soft robotics is to think about, well, you know, if I have something which is compliant, then it's less likely to break something delicate. But now it's actually, you know, th that's that's becoming true. I mean, for example, we've teamed up with marine biologists and we are now bringing soft robot hands down to the bottom of all the world's oceans and uh you know manipulating probing discovering uh you know things which which we couldn't do with with rigid robotic manipulators so that's an extreme example of you know where where would i want to sort of put these soft robots 
Um, and you know, I could argue that you know, if I can, if I can develop systems, soft robots, soft hands that can go to the bottom of the ocean, then surely we should be able to build something that can, you know, pick mm -hmm. proteins that can, uh, you know, make me dinner that can, yeah. uh, you know, hold a surgical tool while the surgeon's hands are doing something else. You know, so, so I, you know, these are these are the things that I, the, those are the things that really excite me is to think about how the field can be brought to more unstructured human-centric environments uh and that's where i see maybe it's an obvious statement but that's where i see the strength of software products yeah thank you for that yeah and do you think ego is important for you when you have this new ideas to convince people but when you are junior maybe do you think this ego for you to important to convince people about what you do the, the e ego side, like the yeah. personal sort of... Yeah, the ego. Do you think it's important for you sometimes when you try to, yeah, you have new ideas or, yeah? Um, again, this I think this also falls under the category of this is easy for me to say because, you know, I've been doing this for however many years now. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have, a, we have a decent track record of things that have been, that have worked reasonably well and all of that. So, uh, no, I think it gets in the way, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I, one of the one of the my sort of favorite things is when I think I have a good idea, and one of my students or colleagues says, "No, that's crap," right? You know, and so so I think that that's that to me is hope. I mean, I don't know, maybe maybe I've got thick skin, but uh, you know, I, I hope that um, you know people aren't ego driven in these i mean the ego is is the enemy in basic research right i mean I, if i am convinced that my solution is the right one when it really isn't that's a problem and and so you know i think that it would be wonderful if we had a mindset where we can share ideas respect each other of course respect mm -hmm. where these ideas are coming from respect the people behind the ideas as ultimately the most important thing but in the end hopefully recognize that some ideas aren't going to work and this goes back to the failure thing too like you know i got a great idea i build it it's not a great idea okay great so that that's fine you know i learned from that and hopefully when my colleagues call me out and say no that's 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 a terrible idea like hopefully i learn why that's a terrible idea so but i know i ego is the enemy in, in, in my estimation yeah i still never speak of that thanks for everything that as well yeah and uh, two questions left. First one, what is the most important quality you have gained while working in academia? And you have to maintain. Um, well, I have a, a, a large-ish group of, of students and postdocs uh, that, that work in the lab. So to me, you know, the, 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 the most important quality, I mean, I'm assuming that, that they're all technically skilled and they are. So let's assume that you know that everybody involved is technically skilled. So I don't, you know, it's not like what's the most important quality? Oh, an understanding of you know nonlinear control systems. No, like let's assume everybody's technically skilled. Um, the ability to work as a team and basically, you know, kind of to the past point, put the ego aside, recognize that we're working on problems which are which are difficult enough that no one of us is going to solve these. Therefore, we have to work together, and not just within our group, but outside of the group and, and academia more broadly. And and so, how can we recognize? Can, can we recognize that? I mean, that that's that quality of of humility of of uh, you know recognizing that other people have good ideas, and let's listen and work well as a team. That is by far the most important to me personally. Great. Yeah. And lastly, what was the best advice was given to you with a person, a professional that was life changing? Uh, hmm. uh, you know, I think it's the, the, the aspect of, of failing that that came, hmm. uh, you know, from, you know, I don't know where that came from, to be honest, but it, it's, I remember it from my childhood is, you know, just understanding like the things you make aren't going to work the first time. And if they do, Maybe you've chosen too easy of a problem, and you know the, the embrace that. 
uh, recognize now in, from the from the case where I am now advising students, recognizing that, that I have to recognize that too. Like I can't have expectations that everything my students are going to build or investigate is going to work well the first time too. So at all levels, mm -hmm. um, you know that recognition, that sort of you know learning experience uh, was the most profound for me. That's right. I really like this point. Yeah. And finally, do you have any final words or thoughts for soft robotics community you'd like to say? Um, I, I don't know. I wish I had words of wisdom, um, but yeah. my, uh, you know, the, I think this, the state of the, the world that we're in now with, with everything that's going on really makes me, um, you know, reflect back on on all of the things that we would do together as a community, which is is sort of maybe less so happening now. So I think that one of the things that I'm personally looking forward to, of course, post pandemic, is having those in person interactions and uh, you know working together in teams that aren't through Zoom. And, and maybe this yeah. is I'm sure this is true for everybody, but um, I guess what would I say? You know. I, Hope, hopefully I'll we'll, we'll all be together again in some of these fun conferences and hope, hopefully in the near future. Yeah, I, I wish the same as well. So thank you once again, Professor Robert. It was very yeah, and inspiring. It's such an honor to have you in the podcast. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.